We're so excited. Registration is officially open for our weekend of workshops in Annapolis, Maryland, September 21st through 24th. You can visit whenkidssaythertrans.com and click on weekend of workshops to find more information. We've had some really, really special events so far and we're really looking forward to this one in September. Yes, and if you've attended previous events, please know this is going to be all new material, workshop style, based on our new book, When Kids Say They're Trans. So we hope to see you there and check our website for more information. Hi, I'm Stella O'Malley, a psychotherapist in Ireland. And I'm Sasha Ayad, an adolescent therapist in the United States. Through in-depth interviews, personal stories, and psychological exploration, We probe the gender landscape within contemporary culture. And we consider the implications of prioritizing personal identity over other aspects of the self. This is the thinking person's take on gender. Join us as we look at gender from a wider lens. Hi, Stella. Hello, how's life with you? It's good. I, I haven't had a solo episode with you in some time, so this is really nice. We'll get to kind of like relax and chit chat. Um, yeah, it's like, it's like hanging out with you. It's like yeah, hanging out I know. <laughs> but I it's love nice. it. I really love yeah. it. Have you been busy these days? I have been really busy. Uh, I've been working on a lot of things for my membership group. I, I have a video coming out about... Um, you know, young people who are kind of trying to run away from themselves by changing their name and changing their identity online and how that's kind of sometimes a vector towards experimenting in real life with an identity change. So that's been really interesting. Wow. And I, I'm teaching a workshop for Ghetto, which I'm really excited about. It's going to be on August 19th, which is a Saturday. And it's about what happens when you are a therapist with an online persona and your clients have very rigid political identities and like, how do you manage that? Because this is an issue that, as you know, comes up a lot. Clients are Certainly. <laughs> Googling their therapists and like trying to see what they say about things and it can be challenging. So, so I'll be teaching a workshop about that in August. I should attend that workshop. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have some difficult questions for the teacher. <laughs> yeah, please throw, throw me the questions. I'm ready for it. Yeah. How about you? Um, yeah, I've I've been I've been pretty busy. We had Alistair back for a second uh, a second go at my Substack, and it was great. We were speaking really about parents and cl- the classic ROGD parent and the challenges they face. And you know the questions were really complex and really powerful, really good. It feels like. You know, it, it, it used to be, and you'll know this well, Sasha, you, the, the first tranche of kind of parents you and I met, they were just in the headlights, in fright, in shock, very scared. Now we've moved into a more reflective space where it's like, well, what's working and what isn't? And what are the issues maybe I need to confront to kind of bring yeah. about change within the household? And that still means there's a medical scandal ongoing in the background or in the foreground. But... There's also what's going on with my own family. Even if this wasn't gender, if this was something else, what would we be talking about? Where would we be going? So um, moving out of the political and going into the personal, really. And and they've been really, really helpful. And we're going to have a few other people. I'm going to have a few other people in the Substack just talking because what happens is that the the comments are very uh, thought provoking and the questions are very thought provoking. I have to say, like, the, the, the the parents can give themselves a, you know, uh, uh, clap in the back. They're so engaged and they're so genuinely trying to get it right. And they've yeah. they're, they're gone through the fires of hell and they're yeah. trying to do it right. It's, it's frightening to watch it and awe-inspiring, mm-hmm. isn't it? It really is. Yeah. These parents yeah. are so deeply, deeply committed and engaged. And like you said, there's a lot of kind of hand wringing of like what we should have done here what we should have done there and I think it really helps to remember that even if this particular gender thing which is is really complicated and it is a scandal even if this wasn't present there might be other difficulties that your family is dealing with so I think that helps to kind of take the pressure off very much so very much so that's great 
And everybody loves when Alistair comes. I mean, he's fantastic. He's amazing. He's such a brilliant speaker. Yeah, he just he gives really him anything. Is. And off he I goes. Know. He can make anything interesting. But it, he is, he's so informed about the parents' issues. And the parents, Pitt, uh, Parents of Inconvenient Truths, have their book coming out soon. Yeah. And that's going to be very powerful. It's, I think it's 15 stories of parents. And any of us who've read, you know, Pit like Substack, it's, it's so many amazing stories in it. That'll be out, and uh, or it might be already out by the time this comes out. And yeah. I think it's going to be huge. I think it's going to be a real, real eye opener to people to yeah, to see great. what's. Yeah, I think it's going to be brilliant. Pitchstone yeah. are publishing it, and they're they're um, they're publishing a lot of interesting books around gender, aren't they? Well done, Pitchstone. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Ahead of the pack is what I yes, call them. Yes, for sure. And um, you know, today's episode is going to be relevant for way more people than just parents. Because we're talking about a very complicated topic that you and I have been thinking about. We've actually been kind of tense about because we're trying to figure out what's going to happen as we move along in this kind of gender world and clinicians who were affirming start to recognize something is wrong, change course, leave the field, or tell their story? And how do we grapple with the fact that some of these clinicians have participated in something very damaging to a lot of young people, and then kind of turn the corner and take a different perspective? And and there's just so many complicated issues around this. So I think anybody observing the whistleblowers has probably had some of these questions on their mind too. And we want to just give that some space today. Yeah, I think no more than it's a very certain type of person who will detransition to who I think there's a huge about more who won't detransition, who will say I've transitioned and I, I shouldn't have, but I'm going to stay transitioned because going back is too big, and too difficult. And I, I haven't the energy or the spirit to do it. So I'm going to continue on within this transition. I could have taken a different road, but I didn't. And in parallel to that, there's a lot of clinicians, arguably, who have um, been affirmative. And on some level, the information will be getting out there, often through detransitioners, are people who regret it, trans regret. And they will think, I don't think, I think I've left my training behind. I think I lost my way. And some of them become whistleblowers, but whistleblowers are, it's a very difficult path to be a whistleblower. They're few and far between, even though yeah. there's scandals everywhere. Whistleblowers don't come up very often. And, you know, uh, we, we were we were kind of inspired to talk about this because we were thinking about the Oedipal trap. And, mm-hmm. you know, w- when you look at the story of, you know, the mythical story of Oedipus and when he was born, he was he was born to King Laius and I'll probably pronounce all of these wrong. So forgive me <laughs> preemptively mm-hmm. and Queen Jocasta. And when he was born, the, there was a, a, a prediction that a he prophecy. was going. Yeah, yeah, that he was going to um, marry his his uh, mother and um, he was sent and away and kill his father and that kill was his the father. Prediction. Yeah. And he was sent away so that this wouldn't happen. And, um, you know, in the myth, inadvertently, the prophecy happens many years later, he does marry his, his mother and kill his father. And the, 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 the mother, when she realises, Queen Jocasta, key part of this, because Sigmund Freud made this big thing, a big psychological point about this, which is the Oedipal complex. And he said that we're all destined <laughs> to want to marry our mother and, and kill our father. And he, you know, he, he, he made a lot of if it. Men, men. <laughs> if men, men. I'm making a mess of this. And then, um, yeah, um, there's another part of the story that feels very psychologically important, which is on realising that this had come true, Queen Jocasta hung herself. She died by yeah. suicide because she couldn't face the reality of what she had done. And Oedipus, no less than Queen Jocasta, took pins out of her dress and stuck them in his eyes. 
it, again with kind of I can't bear what what I'm being faced with. And that's perhaps really interesting psychologically. Maybe there are things we can't face in life that we I am sure there are things we can't face in life. Not only that, I'm sure I've met many people who have faced things that who have just chosen to look away from certain truths about their life because it's too much. And the survivor, the psychological survivor instinct in us just shuts down and says, that way madness lies. I can't. And we look another way. I think this is a big psychological aspect that we need to be aware of in this world. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, I've been thinking about this and... You know, in preparation for this episode, you sent me this amazing podcast, which we'll include in the notes. I think it's a journalist called Megan McArdle, and she talks yeah. about her study of the lobotomy kind of epidemic and uh, Walter Friedman, who was like the big kind of zealous proponent of it. And she clarifies that sometimes we misunderstand what happened. Like there's a certain type of person that paints the lobotomy epidemic as these were these mind control procedures that were pushed onto people in order to subdue them and basically uh, turn people into vegetables. But that's not actually the case. What actually yeah. happened was that there was a variety of outcomes. Many people were subdued and basically sedated mechanically <laughs> and turned into, quote, vegetables. But some people, some rare cases, were successful. And like she describes one lady who went on to get a PhD in math after her lobotomy and mm. that patients were lining up to get these procedures and that this guy, Walter Friedman, until the day he died, was 100 percent convinced that what he had done was really helpful. And even though he had, I think, some of his last patients died because of this procedure, he lived and died convinced that what he had done was actually helpful. And I think... This this is going to be true for gender in a way that like I want to be humble enough to say there are going to be people who genuinely experience relief and think that their gender transition was very beneficial to them. And I don't want to take that experience away from people. I absolutely believe that some people, despite maybe some medical complications or the heavy medical burden that we often talk about, will say, but you know what, at the end of the day, had I not done this, I would have killed myself or I would have died or I would have been miserable. And I'll take, you know, the incontinence or I'll take these kind of complicated medical issues that I'm dealing with now over the misery that I was suffering before. And I think everybody has a right to make sense of their own experience that way. But it's like when you're the clinician and you don't personally have any skin in the game and you're operating in such a way that you're like doing this, these procedures over and over and over and over to lots of patients. And maybe you're in touch with a couple of them. But frankly, we know a lot of affirmative clinicians. They don't know what happened to their patients from eight years ago. They're, they have no idea. But it's like what happens in the mind of an affirming clinician when they're aware that some people are detransitioning, they're aware that some people regret, and other people are fine, what stories are you going to focus on? How are you going to make sense of your practice, your work? And through, you know, what's happening in the UK, we know like something like 35 clinicians uh, resigned from their positions. We in haven't heard from all of them. Yeah, in 2019. So I'm so interested in like, there are therapists, kind of like when we spoke to Sarah Stockton, who like were part of this, realized something was wrong, and then wanted to just walk away and never look back. And I guess this episode is really about all of this. I mean, so there's so much here. And I, I'm, I'm really conflicted about how to make sense of all of it. And not only that, I think there are parents in the mix of all that, who I would argue uh, it's, it's a truth too harsh to take that you might have encouraged your child's transition and it could have been avoided. And they are now physically weakened significantly as a result. I can see how a parent just can't take that. They just, they can't take that truth and they they will therefore, what we do is we, we rationalize it to ourselves and we say we needed to do that. And I, I get, I think we do it a lot. I think we do it a lot. Walter Freeman was particularly um, in, 
intent upon proving to himself and the world that lobotomies were a great thing. And like you say, yeah. you know, many of them died and many of them were, were really left very wounded by these lobotomies. And there he was dying of cancer, crisscrossing America, going to great lengths to find these people that he had lobotomized to prove to himself that they were great. And honestly, he, he did it in good faith. He genuinely died believing it was the best thing that could have been done for those people. He truly believed in the concept and in the in the work of the lobotomist. And this was not somebody who was defending himself. He was advocating positively yeah. for, for lobotomies. Even after they'd gone out of favour, he was still... Um, um, like the Japanese fighter in the woods. So the, there's a few different groups here who would be arguably um, n n n facing the kind of Oedipus trap. They'll be kind of saying to themselves, well, I can't face this truth. And whatever mm. way I, d I can't face the truth that it's been terrible. And so now I, I'm going to have to rationalize in one way or the other. And I'd imagine a lot of clinicians will say to themselves, I gave great therapy. I gave great exploratory therapy. And the people who came through me were actually very well served. And then when it became a little bit hot, I, I moved on. And, you know, I, I kind of did it right. <laughs> and like, you know, yeah. we, we, I could see why. I could see why they would do that. And I'd say parents equally will say, our kid had to transition. They had to. We had no choice. Yeah. We had no choice. And the transitioner will say, I had to transition. And I would argue we, we always have choices. I know in therapy, when somebody comes in and they tell me they've no choice in any context, it's my job to kind of hold the space of, OK, OK, you feel you've no choices. And at the right time, perhaps outline some other options that occur to me that mightn't be palatable, but they are there to be explored. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I think that's our mm -hmm. job, isn't it? To make sure that the other options have been explored. Yeah. And that's the key thing, because like as we're talking, I was having this little argument with myself in my mind that we're we could be accused of telling a kind of just so story. And we could be accused of basically saying even people who say they like their transition are fooling themselves, which is a bit it's a it could be construed as dis construed as disingenuous. Like even people self report that they're happy. We're basically saying that's yeah. not true. <laughs> yeah. but, who the hell do we think we are? You're right. Yeah. But but I think th I think the thing that keeps coming to my mind is like were people given the options yeah. and that's that feels like you know, another issue about informed consent. If you are basically told it's transition or die. Such a good point. You're not actually making a truly informed consent because that could be seen as some sort of, um, you know, I, I don't know what the term is. Like there's a term for it. Some sort of like undue oh, yeah. influence or it's like coercion or something. I can't and remember. And it's a catch 22 as well. Or, or you know, I don't yeah. know, there's a better phrase, but yeah. you don't have yeah. the, I'm sure it's everybody's shouting at it. Is it Hobson's choice maybe? Where you have, <laughs> you have no choice. It's a pretend yeah. choice. Yes, exactly. And exactly. I, I think a lot of people took this choice to transition genuinely thinking that they had no option and genuinely thinking suicide was, was down, down, you know, the, the other road down the road for yeah. them. And um, if if that was the case, then they were faced with the wrong wrong choice because actually that's not true. And so yeah. therefore it's not informed, it wasn't informed, and maybe it's working out, lots of things work out, and maybe it isn't working out, but actually you weren't given the choice in the first place, not the proper yeah. choice, and it wasn't informed. Yeah. It makes me think of when we interviewed Debbie Hayton, and she's told this story many times, like... Before she transitioned, her therapist basically said, look, before yeah. you embark on this process, I want us to explore every single ramification, every single angle, what all your options are, if you do it, if you don't do it, how you'll deal with this, how you'll deal with that. And then kind of coming to this decision after deeply exploring this in a slow way, right? Like the sense of well, urgency that Debbie had. Yeah was intense, but the therapist said, I know you feel urgency, but what we're gonna do is we're really gonna try and look at this from a lot of angles. 
And then I think at that point, it makes a lot more sense to say this was an informed decision, mm. which mm. changes this kind of dynamic with the, the Oedipal trap because, you know, there's a sense of like, you can have less regrets if you know you've really explored. Yeah, yeah. That could give you comfort in the dark night of the soul when you wake up and think, should, should I have done something else? Is this all gone wrong? Um, just to kind of further the kind of, of what, what Debbie Hayden said, because I've heard Debbie say that. And then I've also heard Debbie say in an interview with us mm. that there was this kind of mist of get out of my way. So how able Debbie was to actually discuss it, I would say, was very limited. Limited. It was like, mm. get out of my way. I'm transitioning. The therapist went so far as to put an actual chair in front of the door and say, that's transition. And picked it up and put it on front of the door. I've always thought it was an interesting technique. <laughs> I've never done it yet, but I've always thought it was interesting. I said, <laughs> no. <"Nah." Yes. laughs> I've always wanted to be one of those kind of <laughs> kind of active therapists who does something like that, but I never have the charisma to pull it off. But um, yeah, the chair went on front of the door and uh, the therapist said, let's just dis- explore all the other options. But now, having spoken to Debbie quite a few times about it, I don't think Debbie was open. I think it was completely narrowly. Yeah, 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 yeah. These are the options. These are the options. And I've met people like that Mm -hmm. about various different things. They're technically exploring them. But how much are they? Still, it, it's the therapist's job to still cycle through them <laughs> at a slow level. You know what I mean? And I, I sometimes wonder in that manner. And this is kind of interesting. Does certain types of therapy work better for gender ex- exploration than others? Because if you're going to discuss it in a very um, affirming, gender affirming kind of way, Arguably, you're not going to explore other options because you're going to be led by the client. You're just going yeah. to explore what they think, which will be all the pluses of medical transition. While yeah. if you have a different type of approach, arguably, it's just immediately your school of, 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 of training will mean that you'll explore other options. Yeah. And, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about a quote that I heard on that podcast about the edible trap. Uh, a physician, or no, physicist, sorry, named Richard Feynman said, the first principle <laughs> is not to fool yourself and you're the easiest person to fool. Yeah. So, you know, to, to kind of tie that in with what you're saying, if someone is using a highly affirmative approach that really precludes exploration of other things, it's easier to fool themselves because yeah. they're basically excluding a huge avenue of exploration And then in hindsight, they have almost like this kind of sunk cost fallacy. You know, I've done this with so many patients. It would be too hard to consider that I might have fooled myself. So I'm just going to keep fooling myself. You know, she said something like in the podcast, like every time a surgeon did lobotomies, he had a greater incentive to believe in lobotomies. And I was like, whoa, yeah. that blew my mind. I mean, it's so simple, but it's true. And I wonder, can we say the same thing about these kind of youth gender transitions? Every time a therapist or an endocrinologist or a surgeon engages in some sort of youth affirmation, it just increases their incentive to believe in affirmation. You're so right. And if you're in a clinic, and that's why me and you often, if people are looking for therapists, we say, you know, go for an experienced seasoned therapist who's working on their own because they're much less likely to be caught up in in a group think. If you're in a clinic where um, everybody is um, agreeing with each other, there's a massive collusion going on, arguably, that this is the right thing. And we saw that with the Tavistock and we saw it in Hannah Barnes' book that they were rolling along, even though like by 2016, the results had come in. This is not helping. These puberty blockers are not helping. This is not a success. This is definitely not working. And yet, the, the you know, the dogs bark and the caravan rolls on. It just continued on because they yeah. were in this group think. I remember, and, and it was Megan McArdle, which I really recommend this podcast, she, she talks about Semmelweis, who realised, he was the, the doctor who realised that by washing our hands, the hospitals would massively reduce 
the infant mortality and the maternal mortality. That Mm -hmm. basically physicians and doctors in the 19th century were uh, inadvertently murdering their patients. I shouldn't laugh, but they were through not washing their hands um, after a birth. And, you know, the disease was kind of flying through the hospitals. And, you know, he he ended up in a lunatic asylum, Semmelweis did. Nobody Mm -hmm. would listen to him. And they rejected his theory because it was so, arguably, because it was so horrifying to think all we needed to do was wash our hands to prevent deaths, that it got dismissed. It could not be true that this is such an easy, simple explanation. Equally, I could, I know it's a jump, but equally people could say it could not be true that our kid just needed some some uh, psychotherapy and they might have avoided this massive physical, you know, heavy burden on our on their body. Uh, I can see how people would just say I, I, it's too big to bear and I, I can't take it. And so they rejected Semmelweis's instructions. He was like, you know, Pandora, you know, condemned to see the truth and nobody would listen mm. to him. And it drove him mad. It literally drove him mad. And I could see why even though his, his, his teaching lived on, but he had a very hard time with it. Yeah. I, and so we're, we're kind of talking now essentially about all the different people who might be vulnerable to this edible trap of like, actually, I just have to keep convincing myself that everything we've done is great. It's kind of like that silly internet meme where there's the dog and he's sitting in a house on fire and it says everything is fine. Like, this is fine. This is great. <laughs> well, that's all um, of us <laughs> in the gender yeah. world. <laughs> it's fine. Yeah, this is fine. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, it's it's true in a way, like sometimes all the kid needed was just some basic good old fashioned therapy and sometimes it's even simpler than that yeah. sometimes it's like you just need a, a summer with your you know grandparents on their farm and just a lot of love and leaning in and like family dinners and like hanging out with the dog i mean it's some it sounds so trite it's like the mm. touch grass thing which people make fun of but mm. sometimes it's that simple and when you think about like families who are facing this this fork in the road where one direction is make your entire life around gender, put your child on puberty blockers, rearrange everything, get their name legally changed, develop a new identity for your child, turn them into basically a medical patient forever. People, people must think, well, that could not possibly be the solution unless it was like 100% the right solution. Like people wouldn't accidentally do that to a child, right? Yeah. And then the other solution is like, get some of the unhelpful influences out of their life, keep them busy with other things, lean on with a lot of love, reconnect, bond. Yeah. I mean, it sounds stupid almost. Like it sounds yeah. stupid. Like why would an entire medical system and school system and culture push child to option one if option two could really be helpful. And that's, of course, not the case in all circumstances. But for a lot of these kids, we hear desistance stories. That is what it takes. And of course, it's it's a monumental task for parents to do that because they're constantly being undermined by all these other parts of the culture. But sometimes it is really that fundamental. I know. It reminds me, you know, I played the tin whistle. It's a traditional oh. Irish uh, mu- <gasps> instrument. Okay, next time we have a solo episode, <laughs> you are going to play the tin whistle for us. And we'll, listeners, we'll, we'll, you we'll will lose all our listeners. Home. No, we will not. We'll but gain I'm, a whole new cohort of listeners. Okay, go ahead. We won't. <laughs> um, but it's, it's often said of the whistle, because it is a very simple uh, instrument, that it's simple to play, difficult to master. Mm. And I would say in a very similar way, so is well-being. It's, it's, it's simple to describe and very difficult to master. So when we talk about therapy, it can feel incredibly trite. It can feel so it can feel cringe when you and I are talking about it because it's like, oh, pet the dog, go outside, <laughs> meet your friends. And honestly, we anybody who's lived a certain and that's why it's so interesting watching people who are in their 60s and 70s. They've often mastered it. They've often mastered life as such. They they mm. take it handy. They enjoy their cup of tea. They enjoy their kind of time with their family. 
if the train leaves, they go, oh, we'll get the other. Now, not all of them, but there's a, a good chunk. It's quite noticeable that, you know, pleasure in life ups as some people get older. Not all, but definitely some. Mm. And it's like they've kind of mastered well-being. They've just figured out how to have a nice day and how to, and if you have enough nice days, you, you, you will be kind of moving away from mental health difficulties. And it's not easy, is it? Yeah, that's such a good point. That's such a good point. And I mean, this also comes up because the the stakes feel so high with the gender world. So I I know sometimes when these debates are happening around therapy, people are like, well, these kids are in distress. What do you do? Like, what are the the therapeutic techniques? What is the therapy? Mm. What is the treatment? Yeah. It's actually probably a very annoying answer, but like yeah. the kids that I've worked with that I've seen improve, and sometimes totally. they're still they're still identified as trans, but they're just so much healthier mentally. Yeah, it's just such a slow process. It's like yeah. the waves of the ocean; like the tide comes in, the tide goes out. The tide comes in. We address this as it comes up. Self reflection, a little bit of like self awareness, or what are your patterns? It's so simple. But yeah. it's very hard to master and it takes a lot of time and it takes consistency. And um, yeah. sometimes, you know, therapists who are starting this work will reach out to me and they, they get in this gridlock immediately with the client about like gender stuff and medical stuff. And it's like, it's not even about that. We just yeah. have to go really slow. Um, and also, I, I, because I'm just, I'm just back from holidays and I, I was at um, a music festival where I was learning the whistle and I'd gone there in my early 20s in the very same place, the very same class, right? And so that was maybe 25 years ago. And I remembered young me in those classes. And I often say I was kind of animalistic. I remember my intensity. I, re- I was sitting there remembering oh. me. And I remember just how behavioural I was. I was just compelled to do things. Back then, mm. I just felt, I have to do this, I have to do that. This is happening, that's happening. And now I'm, I'm 48, I've, it's like I'm so much more reflective. And I'm not sure how anybody could have given that to me. I, I think only time was going to give this to me. I, yeah. I really do think I, I had, there was nothing that could have unclenched me. They could, it could have maybe made my, my way a little bit easier. But there was yeah. a, a, a genuine time to, to mellow out. And yeah. if somebody, if, I, if that person, that person who I was at 23, is intent upon transitioning, how much are they able to listen to other people's views when they're like get out of my way I need to transition mm-hmm. and and all we can do arguably is bring about some more self-awareness a reflection of how you'll change in the future a kind of a humility of how little we know at, at a certain age you can do things like that but it's a long program this yeah. is not something that's going to happen in 12 weeks with a therapist Oh, totally, totally, totally. I I think that's very important to remember. We hope you're enjoying this episode of our podcast. We work very hard to maintain high quality content for the show. To take an even deeper dive and support the show, join our listener community for access to exclusive content, practical tools and resources supporting gender and identity exploration. We're so grateful to our sponsor, Genspect, an international organization which offers an alternative to WPATH providing a range of education, resources, and supports to anyone impacted by gender distress, GenSpect unites many different organizations globally and gives voice to thousands of previously untold stories. For more info, visit genspect.org. And thank you to our sponsor, GetA. GetA is an association of therapists who believe that individuals experiencing gender-related concerns ought to be treated using a whole person approach. We connect like-minded clinicians, provide educational resources and training, and help people with gender dysphoria find the right help. Visit GETA at genderexploratory.com. And now back to the conversation. Um, I, I want to bring up kind of another angle of this, which you and I were t- talking about before. Um, so many parents and l- let's say like observers of this gender thing with youth 
from very early on have been saying this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong. Yeah. yeah. Okay, and then we have very crucial characters in the story, this entire story, of people who are like, oh no, I did this gender affirming thing. I did it to hundreds of kids and now I'm realizing it was wrong and I'm here to tell my story. Yeah. And I will be in full transparency, honest, that I feel really conflicted about what to do with this. I mean, on one hand, there's a very rational part of me that says, you know, we have to understand this is a medical scandal. Everybody was wrapped up in it. We have to have open arms for all of the people who, you know, were brave enough to recognize what they did wrong. They didn't fall into the Oedipal trap. They were honest with themselves. They came forward and they're telling these stories from in the trenches, you know, like they're telling the actual stories of these yeah. clinics and these cases. And a part of me is like, it's a complicated role to become a hero after you've done something that you admittedly recognize was really damaging. And it's just complicated. And I, I think we just need to give that some space. And I, I, I'm really conflicted about how to experience it. I am too. I am too. I think it's, it's really difficult. I wasn't there. I wasn't in a gender clinic. I do know when I found out about it, I just thought, no, <laughs> no, I couldn't be. I don't know what it's like to work in a clinic. I've never worked in a clinic with lots of other therapists, if you follow mm -hmm. me. So mm -hmm. I, I, I can imagine, because I've worked in children's home where stuff was going on that I wasn't happy with. I remember I just wasn't happy with the way things were. And I left. You know, I that's what I did. I left. I, I looked at it, tried to change it, didn't get anywhere, left. Now, it wasn't quite the level of, of, of nothing like the level of, of gender affirmation, but certainly I kind of got a taste of how I would respond in this. You know what I mean? Wait, when I, you say a children's home, was it kind of like an orphanage or like foster care kind yeah, of situation? It was, it was, yeah, foster care, uh, residential, teenage boys. Okay. And I just, I didn't like the derogatory attitude, the, um, the, the people who worked in the place. And I didn't, I didn't like... Uh, I remember, you know, they'd be kind of giving them writing down the menu and they'd say, you know, they had a good dinner of, you know, meat and vegetables. And it was actually like chicken, popcorn and chips. That that was technically meat mm. and vegetables. I know it's minor, mm. but it used to bug me. No, but, I get what you're saying. Yeah. yeah. The, the notes were very, very polished Misleading, to what was. Yeah, yeah very. And I was like, wow, the language is so clever here about what's going mm. down and what's going down is really quite unhealthy. So, um, yeah, I left and I, I know, I think enough of myself to know that if I was in the gender clinic, I think I'd leave and I think I'd leave sooner than an awful lot of people have left. It feels very uncomfortable for me to hear, you know, people who are in massive positions of responsibility with huge salaries and um, worked in it for, for many years. And like, how long are you in it where you think, well, now you're colluding with it, you know what I mean? How long is kind of, now you've become part of the problem, you know what I mean? Because there's a mm -hmm. certain, the certain mm -hmm. couple of years, I suppose, that you're figuring out what's going on. Mm -hmm. Then there's a couple of years of you're definitely saying, this is definitely wrong. And then you've kind of gone into the problem. You've become part of the problem. And it's yeah. not for me or you to kind of judge that, but it is, I suppose, going to become very uncomfortable as years go by. And we meet people who'll say, oh, thank you for your work. And it's great. And I was 10 years trans and kids. And we'll go, oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's really I, difficult. I, yeah, it's really difficult. And I mean, I think the truth is there are far more people who are continuing to work in gender clinics and doubling yeah. down. And so, I mean, there's a always point. like a, a kind of compared to what question that we have to ask ourselves. And the truth yeah. is on the, on this planet, there are a huge variety of people and personalities and backgrounds and types True. of people and people are going to approach this differently. I think for me, when I, when I notice that a person in this situation who like used to be part of a gender clinic and has now left, when I sense that there's a real recognition, maybe like a sense of remorse, maybe like a real effort to try and be part of the solution, I think that's a really 
encouraging thing yeah. that I can observe. And, and, you know, part of me feels a little bit like, I guess, curious and a little bit agitated at people who are just like, I'm going to get out and never look back and not be part of the solution and not contribute and not share what I know to help rectify the situation like that to me I guess because it's so it's frustrating for me you know just yeah. being honest I, I wonder like where are all the people who are like "Ooh, whoops uh trans a bunch of kids I'm just gonna get out and keep my head down like I I don't understand that I mean if I was in that position I I, I can imagine the impetus to do that but I think that frustrates me and that's part of this like, what do we do as this disintegrates and falls apart? Is anybody going to be held accountable? Who should be held accountable? Like, I think mm -hmm. if somebody is willingly coming forward and saying, oh, my God, I'm realizing what we've done wrong and I want to be part of the solution. Do we want to hold those people accountable? I don't think so, because they're part of no. it's kind of like, you know, in an investigation, if somebody is willing to be you know, an informant or a witness, like they're trying to solve the problem. So they get a lot of grace. Like, this is an interesting question, you know? Um, but are there going to be people who just oopsie daisy, just kind of back out of the situation and become invisible? And what will happen to all of those people? You know, well, you're right. I think if you're a whistleblower, you hold a special st status, yeah. even if you're a late s whistleblower, even if it takes you a little bit of time. Yeah. If you're a whistleblower, you, you, you are trying to rectify and you've already put yourself into a different position. If you back out and silently move over to the eating disorder clinic or you move over to the, um, I don't know, the, 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 the OCD clinic or whatever, and you choose not to blow the whistle on what went on, but you continue to, to, to maintain your position as a psychologist or a psychotherapist, yeah. I think that um, is pretty immoral. I think I, I really do. I think especially if you've got a salaried position and you you had training and you lost your way. I, I think it's it's pretty it's pretty damning on your character. And some people will blow the whistle loud and clear like Jamie Reed really, really did. You know what yes. I mean? And it must have taken huge courage I know. for her to do yeah huge courage to do what she did and i'm so glad she did but i do think as the whistleblowers come out wouldn't you think more would come and wouldn't you think anybody who's now in this position and who have heard the whistleblowers they've like i said there's a certain amount of time where you're almost morally okay i'm going to sound like a priest here but like then there comes a bit of time where no you you've stayed beyond decency and yeah. um i think people they it's amazing what they'll do for a salary i think it's amazing what people will put up with for a salary you know and uh, by the way you know you mentioned those 35 clinicians it was 35 clinicians in 2019 had left the tavistock jids at the tavistock and we now know through hannah Barnes' book time to think that you know it was really really shoddy what was going on there and it's still ongoing but it'll be closing soon i i know it's it's really it's producing much better work these days um as far as i know anyway but those 35 clinicians we can only name a few of them yeah we couldn't we name many of them. them yeah but not very many active, of them right, right yeah where's the rest of them presumably they just moved on into different places quietly yeah. Even though David Bell spoke up, Marcus Evans spoke up, even though there was the book, you know what I mean? It's amazing that they feel, I wonder, do they feel tainted for working there and just hope that everybody forgets it? Or do they just think, I cannot think about that time. It was a hard time in my life and I can't think about it. Or, or maybe there are people who are like, no, this was totally mischaracterized and I think we did amazing work. Because, I mean, Hannah Barnes right. did interview some clinicians who kind of took that perspective. So, yeah. I, you know, I don't think we can assume that everybody is like, oh, no, we've made a mistake. Some people are kind of like in this Oedipal trap where they're, you know, and again, like, we're calling it the Oedipal trap. Maybe they genuinely <laughs> only worked with clients who, who were so much better after transitioning. I'm I'm willing to entertain that possibility. So am I. But um, kind of, some people yeah. are probably fooling themselves. Yeah, and I, I do think there will be a huge amount of people who have worked in pretty 
mindless clinics that were transing a lot of people, uh, children, young, without thinking about it, without informed consent. I think a lot of them will say, my patients, my patients got good treatment. Whatever was going on, but mine was good. That's the way we rationalise every single other decision we make. We think, I I did the best with what I can. And, you know, Maya Angelou said that lovely quote, you know, you did with the best with what you knew at the time. Yeah. And now you know better, you'll do better type thing. And it's also a rationalisation, isn't it? It's also a way of rationalising, you know. And yes, we do do the better, the best we can. And sometimes the best is pretty weak and it's it's pretty cowardly. Yeah, and I mean, I think this is the thing. You know, we're, we're all human beings. There There are various levels of engagement, interest, energy, passion, dedication that you find in a field, you know, like you take, yeah. you know, 10 different teachers, for example, and you're going to find some teachers who are just amazing and they t- touch the child's life and they can change the direct, you know, direction of a young person's future. And then there are other teachers that are just there for the paycheck. And then there's a variety of people in between. And of course, the same is true for therapists. Therapists are not some kind of magically hand selected cohort of you know, Ethical. careful geniuses. <laughs> yeah, yeah, There's yeah. a variety of people. And, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about something you said earlier that I just want to raise um, when you were working in the children's home. I used to work in a state supported living center in Texas, and it was basically like a residential kind of campus where people who had intellectual disabilities lived there. And there were a variety of different kind of levels of functioning. So there were some individuals who lived there who had to be fully like bathed, cared for, fed, teeth brushed by other people. And then there were individuals who were like my clients who were ambulatory. They could like walk around on their own. They, you know, had relationships. They talked. They they did all the like kind of normal things, but they all were intellectually disabled. And they had a lot of complicated mental health issues. And I was hired to actually develop a counseling program. There was no counseling program in this facility. And anyway, I was there for a couple of years and there were a lot of things that I noticed, which I started to feel uncomfortable with, like stuff like what you described, like, you know, if there was, let's say, some sort of an issue with a a client or a resident, the paperwork that had to be written up would be written in such a way to really um, make the staff seem like they were completely not in the fault and it was the client's fault, you know, things like that. The language, Um, very clever language. language. Yeah. Yeah. And there was psychiatrists on staff. And like, I thought a lot of my clients were over medicated to be, you know, a little bit more manageable for their staff because the staff were all totally like overworked, kind of not qualified to really be dealing with the complexity of issues that were part of their job. And then sometimes, you know, if we had residents who let's say were sent to the psych hospital for like a really acute situation, they'd come back even more medicated, like walking zombies almost. And our staff would be like, oh my God, I feel so sad for so-and-so. Look how medicated they made her. So there's always a question of like relative to what. And then just one other thing I want to say about this. A lot of our clients had really aggressive behaviors. Like I was physically attacked by a client there. And Mm -hmm. I was... It was terrifying. I mean, it was physically assaulted. And some of these clients had like sexual assault charges and like really complicated things. And it's like, were they living the most ideal life on this campus? Well, compared to what? If they weren't there, some of them would be homeless. Some of them would be in jail. Some of them for sure would be drug addicts. Some of them would have been trafficked into sex work. Like I know 100% that would have been the case because some of these girls were incredibly innocent and naive and didn't understand like anything that's going on around them. So they lived amongst their friends. They had relationships. They were cared for. They were fed. They had their own bedrooms. Each person had their own room and they, they, they lived a life that was pretty good compared to the alternative. And so when I when I think about that, I could be accused of being part of this Oedipal trap, right? Like yeah. Sasha's just justifying the over medication of her patients because she's thinking about their homelessness. But in reality, <laughs> like on planet Earth, that is that is the choices that they 
kind of could have had laid out for their lives. And maybe if all of them had incredibly wealthy families, they could afford to go to some super specialized. But these are people who come from like a variety of backgrounds. Some of those clients actually were born with deformities and their parents dropped them off as babies and drove away and never came back for them. So what are the alternatives for those people? Now, I say this just because I think there are a lot of affirmative clinicians and parents and all kinds of people who say, if I hadn't affirmed my cl- my child would have done this or the child would have done that. or, and, and these are real things that we all kind of tell ourselves to try and explain less than ideal circumstances, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, what you what you brought up has really reminded me of, you know, what, what replaced lobotomy and, you know, Walter Friedman's great, great solution of lobotomy was heavy psychiatric drugs. Yes. And that yeah. sedated people. So we moved from lobotomy to really heavy drugs that literally turn people, like you say, walking zombies. And some people are horrified by that. But it was arguably better than getting a, an ice pick and putting it through your eye to, to kind of pick at your brain, which is what the lobotomy was doing. But um, it's very interesting when you would start thinking about, well, who who are some of these people sedating? Some of them are very violent. And when you're violent at six, it's fine. But when you're violent and you're a 26 year old man because of whatever your mm. challenge is, well, then society has to make these hard decisions. And yeah, we could rationalize it all we want, but we also have to make the decisions. And I don't think we have any option. So I, I think it's a fair enough rationalization, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah, I remember like hearing about uh, in the Med- Megan McArdle's podcast, Russ Roberts, the guy who was interviewing her, and it was really good. And he was talking about these yeah. dementia pa- patients who just scream all day, literally scream all day. Yeah. I, and I could see how the workers say, no, they have to be sedated or I can't work here. I, I, I can see how that would happen. And, and when they brought that up in the podcast, another thought I had was how... How is that person who's screaming feeling? I mean, are you happy if you're literally screaming all day? Wow. So it, it, these are very complicated issues. And I mean, I think this is why I think this is why you and I are trying to put forward alternatives, because like everything we've talked about so far is is something that comes up in the context of there's no alternative, you know, mm. like. When there was no medication, lobotomies were used. I mean, it's not a great solution, right? But it's always like, well, what else can we do? Mm. And I think that's, that's as we know, we've you know interviewed the affirmative clinicians. That's what they say. Well, if we didn't do this, the alternative was a miserable life or self, self-castration or something like that. Like when we talked to Anne Lauren. So oh, that's why I think the whole point is like we have to put forward alternative possibilities or else people can just keep saying, well... If we didn't, then it would have been a catastrophe. And they were even talking, I think, in that podcast about something about like nuclear war or something yeah. and decisions being made and and the justification being had we not done this, so and so million people would have died. And it's like, well, how do you know that actually? Mm. <laughs> we don't well, know. It, it was the justification for, for releasing the atom bomb that a million yes. Americans would have died. And then they went on to talk about political leaders, by and large, never put their hands up and say, we made a mistake. They, they yeah. never say that mass bombing, that, that bloodshed, that war was a mistake. That never really happens in, in real time. It might happen as the, histori- the analysts in history declare that was wrong or this was wrong. But in real time, it doesn't happen. And in the meantime, we have people uh, uh, in our experience right now in real time making decisions that could end up being massive, massive regrets, watching people make and parents watching children make what they believe is a massive decision that will be very regrettable, whether they admit it to themselves or not. And it's it's a very difficult thing to behold, but you've got to, on some level, I think we've got to be aware of, we we have free will. And when you're an adult, the, the freedom to do as you wish without hurting other people is, is the key freedom. It, it really is. So I do think people like Anne Lawrence would transition. She, we had her on the podcast for those who don't mm-hmm. know, and she's a trans oh, woman, yeah. she's in her 70s. 
she, she she would transition no matter what. She never let it go. She was going to transition, I think, one way or the other. Now, we have to kind of put into in society, mm-hmm. th- uh, make sure that this is accounted for within society so that it's it's not causing an imposition on other people. Like, it has to be on some level, kind of, everybody has to kind of, everybody, ha- uh, the risk assessment has to be on the world as such, and the impact assessment mm. has to be kind of equally faced. But it's it's very, very tricky because medical transition is not just a personal choice of something somebody does. It's also a choice within society. It's a societal choice as well. I don't think yeah. we talk about that enough, but I think it's it's true. It's a, it's impacting society. Well, lots of things we do impact society, I suppose. Yeah, it's like you're you're having like a debate with yourself. <laughs> You know what I mean? And that's the way these that's the way these conversations go. I mean, I think I know. If, if we're being honest with ourselves, these uh-huh. are just not simple. These are just no. not simple solutions. There's no simple answer. And no. it's 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 I can I can understand why people have to double down. And I can understand why people might think that we are refusing to see the benefit in some cases. Like, I mean, to be able to hold the tragic cases and the success cases at the same time is yeah. not easy because it kind of forces you to to yeah. argue with both both sides of the debate, per se. Um, uh-huh. And then there are people who 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 are who are kind of lightly doubling down is is doubling down or just maintaining because they're thinking I'm not going back so I'm just maintaining and I'm going to continue in this in this complex state and in a way it gives you a kind of cognitive itch because you're continuously and I can see it a lot of as we were talking earlier Sasha a lot of our listeners are trans and they they understand I'm very glad they are but they under they have kind of understandably ended up in a place where they think about gender so much yeah. because yeah. of their decision to transition. It's become the major player in their life as opposed to anything else. You know what I mean? Their friends or their relationships or whatever. And I can see why, but this kind of cognitive itch of, it's like the brain is a problem solving organ. And when we have a, a, a kind of unresolved state happening, we keep on going back to it, going back to it, like a chess problem. We keep on yes. going back to it. Yeah. Yeah. Hence, I could see why if you were in the middle of gender transition, you just keep on going back, eat it up, everything to do with gender. Let me think about it. Let me think about it. Because you're trying to scratch the itch of an unresolved issue. Yeah. 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 And I mean, I, I'm glad you bring this up because this is something we were talking about a little bit before we started recording. If, if, if you are somebody who's pretty self-reflective and you're trying to understand an experience you're having and all of the narratives that are available to you don't really land, they don't really hit the spot, they don't really <laughs> scratch the itch, you're going to keep searching for an understanding, you know, unless you get to a point, some people get to a point where they say, you know, I I don't need to know why, like, I just know that this is what's working for me. And that's fine. And that's great, too. Right. But some people are really seekers, they're, they're deeply introspective, and they want to understand. And um, I mean, this came up because we we wanted to read some reviews, which maybe we'll kind of end the podcast this way. Yeah. Um, and and I've noticed because we look at the YouTube comments, we have some incredibly dedicated viewers and podcast listeners who comment on every single episode. And it's like, <laughs> you know, we're starting to get to know them and yeah. they're often very, very encouraging. And a lot of these listeners, like you said, are trans. And I think they're people who feel like for some reason or another, I'm having this experience I'm interested to understand myself better. And a lot of the other narratives out there kind of fall flat. I don't yeah. think I'm like this mentally ill person who's delusional, like the way some right wing people say. And I don't think it's just um, this completely neutral thing to celebrate that is only problem because of transphobia. Like there's something else going on here and I want to understand it. So anyway, I, I'm really, I'm really touched that we have, 
so many different kinds of listeners from all parts of this kind of experience around gender. And so maybe we can read a couple of our reviews. What okay. Do you think? Yeah. Go on. Read out okay. a few. Okay. So this first one says one of the best resources out there. Such thoughtful, oh. well-reasoned, and compassionate take from two very intelligent women. This is a fantastic resource for anyone who has a transgender or gender-questioning person in their life. Oh. That is from Monster Missa on Apple Podcasts. So thank you. That was a five-star review. Well, thank do you, you, do you have them Missa. pulled up? No, I'll, I'll wait. <laughs> okay. I, was go- I thought okay. I was going to comment wisely. <laughs> I'll okay. Pull them up. <laughs> okay. You go okay, to I'll, read this, I'll yeah. read this next one. Um, oh, I don't have the full review here visible, but I'll read part of it. Informative, humane, and nuanced. Five stars. Thank you for shedding light on the ideological gender stranglehold. Despite good intentions by some, that is setting back gains that gay people and women have made over the past few decades. I'm grateful for your courage, and I'm sure you're getting some blowback as some of these one star non reviews, something or other. So unfortunately, I can't click on read full review, but this person is kind of defending us against the one star reviews. But I think we should even read the one star reviews. There, yeah. There's a couple of them here. Do you see yeah. that transphobia review? Yeah. Do you want to read it? Yeah. Okay. No, I'm, you, I'm just reading another one. Even the face. Okay. Even in the face. <laughs> I just made me giggle. Even in the face of a manic guest shouting and clicking at them. <laughs> these two stay calm <laughs> and address the guest, ask thoughtful questions and put together a riveting podcast on a very difficult subject. I have a feeling I know what, what episode that was. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a reference to our James Cantor episode, which I wrote a long tweet thread about it. I really enjoyed having uh, James on, but some of our listeners were protective over us. They felt like... And and can I say, you know, some people are a character and James Cantor is definitely a character. And when you meet them, you kind of there's often a moment where you go, what? Uh, And then you go with the character. You understand what they're like. And I don't mean a character in a in a dismissive way that they're a very idiosyncratic person. They have their way. And I would say he's definitely (laughs) (laughs) clicking at them. (laughs) Take out another review there. Okay, so this one says transphobia. That's the title of the review. It has one star. Just from the descriptions, it looks like this podcast tries to put on a pseudo-intellectual veneer on their transphobic ideology, pretending to come from all sides, but mostly promoting anti-trans sides. Okay, and I'll read another kind of one star review, but I don't have the full review here. A podcast about the complex topic of gender identity from a simplistic binary mindset and a narrow-minded point of view. This podcast engages listeners in a very biased examination of gender identity as a whole, pushing anti-trans ideas with misconstrued science and a perverse understanding of something. Oh. I'm so sorry I don't have the full review here. Uh, I've, got, I've got a full one-star okay. review in front of me. Okay. These- these podcasts purport to inf- offer impartial advice around gender dysphoria and transgender issues. However, it appears to be mostly gender critical propaganda, more typically promoted by religious conservative groups rather than by oh. the vast majority of the scientific and medical and uh, neurological community. I find the the whole premise to be deeply misleading and seem to invalidate transgender lives. I have to say the jump to religious at it's this funny. stage, yeah. it feels a bit disingenuous by now. Oh, my God. At the start, I thought, oh, God, they're calling me religious. But now, all these years later, and they're still saying gender critical is religious. It feels very dishonest at this stage. Yeah. It's and not, I mean, I think like... people are not really listening to to us. Listen to me. <laughs> so like, Listen to me. But I mean, to call <laughs> to call our podcast religious is so far from even remotely the truth. That's it's just it's just patently ridiculous. And to say it's simplistic, I think we get pretty deep. I don't think it's simplistic what we do here. But anyway, there, there's yeah. some positive reviews too, balanced and informative. I've yeah. now listened to a few episodes of this series in tandem with a couple of other podcasts in an attempt to understand this phenomenon. The series has proved informative, balanced, and entertaining. I now feel like I could discuss the topic with a decent grasp of the terminology and background. So I think that's wonderful. And thank you. I mean, yeah. if, if you are a listener who doesn't like our podcast, you know, feel free to suggest 
topics that we should explore or guests. I mean, I'm open to I'm open to having on people who have a different perspective. Unfortunately, and, and we've talked about this before, people who are highly, highly ideological don't seem to be interested in having any kind of dialogue. I mean, we had Steensman de Vries on, and I would say they're probably furthest from our perspective, but we engaged in a respectful conversation and it was fine. So um, if you if you don't like our show and you have ideas on things that we're misrepresenting, you know, let us know. But I, I think part of something I pride myself in is really trying to genuinely understand the arguments coming from the affirmative side. So I feel like I have a pretty good grasp of it. But so if, if if we're wrong, let us know. It's kind of interesting. Um, Freud would have a fle- field day or... An analyst would have a field day on us because we started this episode with the Oedipus trap, talking about how we rationalize all our decisions. And we finished the episode with let's read out reviews and console ourselves that we're brilliant. (laughs) Yeah, you're right. Okay, so basically you're saying we take the whole episode and put it in the dustbin and just move on. This is never going to be published. I see it. I see one nice one here. They say um, the guests they have bring their knowledge of this subject and they're allowed to speak openly about gender and trans issues. It's informative and wide ranging. All parents of teenage and younger children should be listening to them as they take you through the stages of trans identity to transition in an open and honest way. They speak in a respectful way about people who have transitioned and give a voice to detransitioners. Well, I hope we do. We certainly yeah. try to do all that, and that that's yeah. our plan. I'm sure we make as many ma- many mistakes as the next person, but I suppose the most important thing is if we keep on bringing on guests, and especially when they don't agree with us, it'll be good for us, and it'll be good for everybody involved. You know what I mean? Yeah. The more we bring in echo chamber guests, you know, it's it's fine, but the more we bring on different perspectives, the better. So if if you are listening and think you could blow our minds with some insight that we haven't thought of. I'd be delighted, absolutely delighted yeah. to have them on. Yeah, I think that's a great tip. And, you know, I, I find that even when we have guests on who genuinely or generally agree with us, there are always areas of disagreement. There are always actually areas of like, oh, I never thought of it that way. So there's always deeper we can go, even if we, for the most part, are aligned with a lot of our guests. So. I'm interested in deep conversations. Me I too. don't care if we agree or don't agree. I Me want the too. conversation to be really deep and thoughtful. So I'm very open. Yeah, th- thought-provoking conversations. So long yeah. as they're thought-provoking, that's good enough, really. Yeah. All right, Stella. Well, I guess we'll sign it off here. Okay, catch again. All right, bye. Thanks for joining us this week on Gender, A Wider Lens. Listener support means a lot to us. If you enjoy the show, please like and subscribe on iTunes and leave a review. For more information, visit widerlenspod.com. There you'll learn about joining our listener community, how to contribute to our show, and where to find us on social media. Our discussions are for educational purposes and are not intended as a substitute for mental health services.